echoes of Arawak life still survive here. The Arawaks were great fishermen. And in his log, Columbus describes a very well-arranged boathouse, covered so that neither sun nor rain could do any damage. Today, Cubans here build similar structures in much the same way. Columbus also described the large settlements where the Arawak lived. All are built of beautiful palm branches. Inside, they're very well swept and clean. The furnishings are arranged in good order. They're constructed like pavilions, very large, and look like royal tents in a campsite without streets. Columbus wrote admiringly of the Arawak's world, their way of life and peaceful nature. But he also wrote that with a few Spaniards, he could subdue the entire population. This is the site of an Arawak village outside Baracoa. Today it's protected land. No one lives here except for one woman, a descendant of the Arawaks. Carmen Pommier collects Indian artifacts for a local museum. She is surrounded by the ghosts of a vanished past. My grandmother used to tell me that the Indians lived off fishing. Many of them lived at the bank of the river. And when Columbus arrived here, at the land, as they say, when he first put his foot here, he said it was the most beautiful land. And it is said that the Spaniards who came later hunted and killed the Indians. I'm very sorry, because if that hadn't happened, there would be much more of the Indian race than there is today. It pretty much finished them off, that hunting down of the Indians. that followed Columbus's first voyage. The Arawaks were forced to provide food, tribute, and labor to the Spanish. Those who resisted were enslaved or killed. But even in the days of first contact in 1492, deadly forces were at work that neither the Spanish nor the islanders understood. Forces that sealed the fate of the Arawaks. In this large native burial ground in Maita, there is a clue, a single Spanish skeleton. Here we may be in the presence of a tragedy. Even though this place was used as a burial site before the Spanish arrived, it's likely that when the Spaniards came, they brought with them diseases that infected the native population. As a result, many of the islanders died. This Spanish skeleton may be proof of this. He died here. He had probably been sick, and he may have infected many of the local people. Perhaps they are the ones we now see buried in this place. by the trauma of invasion and exploitation, they were highly vulnerable to infection. Within only 50 years of Columbus's arrival, the Arawak population was virtually destroyed. left Cuba behind for a 
large island to the southeast called Ohio. It was there, he was told, he would finally find the treasures he sought. Columbus needed to find something soon. All he had seen so far was a group of beautiful islands with a small population of poor natives. How could he deliver on his promises to the Spanish sovereigns without anything of tangible value? From Cuba, Bojillo was a day's sail away. Columbus renamed the island Hispaniola, now home to Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Hispaniola is the most beautiful thing I have ever seen. The best country in Castile cannot compare to it in beauty and fertility. There is no one who can describe it and no one who can believe it if he does not see it. After a few days' sail, Columbus arrived in Accuo Bay to a spectacular welcome. More than a hundred canoes came out to the ships. A thousand Indians went through them, Columbus says. And first of all, he noticed the women. The women were very beautiful. They went totally naked except for their ornaments. They didn't even wear the cotton loincloth which had been seen elsewhere. They were uninhibited. And, Columbus said, their husbands were not jealous. A lot of them went by, and as these Indians turned up, it was visible that they had a hierarchy, that they were chiefs and counselors. And among these chiefs, the greatest was Guacanagari, who was to become Columbus's ally in these parts. Guacanagari was a powerful man, one of five chiefs who ruled Hispaniola. The island was the most populous Columbus had seen, with perhaps a quarter of a million people. But more importantly, it was also richer than any of the others. Guacanagari gave Columbus gifts of gold nuggets and jewelry. Here, finally, were signs of the wealth Columbus had always dreamed of. 